You'll hear this story and you'll also be gaining knowledge when you listen to it on how to do these things. I realized that like my concern was really just what people were going to think of my decision and oh my god she's crazy what is she doing she's not you know she's supposed to be pursuing a career this is when she's supposed to be finding a job and I that doesn't appeal to me that yeah. never appealed to me. Play a major role in spreading the love and the joy and uh, reducing our imprint you know for for future generations and for all that we share this planet with. I was just embarrassed. I felt like I couldn't do it, like I'd already failed. I had no idea what I was doing. What did I get myself into? What was I thinking? Our history of humanity really revolves around great people. And that's, that's all we know about. And why is that? It's because the insignificant people weren't important enough that somebody would take the time to document their life. Hello everyone, welcome to the podcast. My name is Kaylin Otto and you are listening to The Unruly Podcast. So today, this is sort of a special episode because I don't have a guest on. It's just me talking and that's not what makes it special. What makes it special is that very soon I have a book called The Art of Unruly Travel on a Budget that will be published and will be out in the world and you will be able to get your hands on it, hold it in your hands or have it as an ebook if that's what you want. So listen to this. Do you hear that? That's paper. That's the book. Print it out. All ready to go right here in my hands. I don't know how to make paper sound, so I'm just like throwing this paper around. Um, and I went on social media. I went on Instagram. I went on Facebook and asked those who listen to the podcast or who are interested in budget travel or the book, what sections you would like to hear me read out of the book? What are you most interested in? And people voted for hearing stories that went incredibly right, hearing stories that went incredibly wrong, and hearing how to find work when you are traveling. So I have pulled out these three sections of the book and I am going to read them to you from the book so that you can listen to this podcast and you can see if this something this is something you'd be interested in. You can get a little free sample and you can share this episode with anyone who you think may benefit or be really excited about this book coming out. So before we get into those readings, I want to say thank you so much for being so supportive. I've wanted to self-publish this book so that I could have full control over it and um, receive all the money that comes from it so I can put it into making more copies of the book and still keep that full control. And I did send it out to some big travel publishers, travel book publishers, and it didn't get accepted, but it got accepted by a few different smaller publishers. And I think that I've finally decided which one I'm going to go with. So just an update on the book. Your fundraising helped me so much. It's going to help me, um, along with some funds of my own, get this book formatted, get it edited one more time, even though I've already had multiple wonderful editors already go over this book. They're going to do one last edit. They're going to format it into an ebook, and so it can be printed, and hopefully I'm able to print through them. And I'm going to be paying for this all up front. Thank you for anyone who donated to the fundraiser. That was so big. I felt so supported and held. So thank you. Thank you. So that money is going to that very soon. Um, I'm waiting for a couple people to get back with me, back to me with reviews of the book before I send it over and hand it all over to the publisher and let them do their thing. So on my end, I'm ready to go. I'm excited and I'm ready to get this book out into the world. Are you ready to see it? Are you ready to hear it? Um, I just wanted to say thank you before I began because, like, you know, have you ever had a project that is your baby? It's all of your experiences and memories and feelings and even skills wrapped up into one thing and you put it all together because, you know, people are always asking me, like, how do you find work how you, when you travel? How do you find the cheapest modes of transportation? How do you do this? How do you do that? And there's so many different answers and sometimes people are asking multiple things and I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to put this into a book so I can just hand it to you and you can run with it. So I'm so excited to be able to do that. Thank you for supporting this book. Thank you for supporting my work and I hope you get 
so much out of it. So first we're going to start off with a good story. Something that went incredibly right. And like I said, I'm going to read right from the book. So this story that I'm going to read for you, uh, I, I have told it on the recent series that I did, When the Travel Bug Bites, the last four podcast episodes. I definitely told this story in those episodes. Um, but I'm going to you know, tell it to a different way now because this was me literally writing it down, condensing it into a very small story. So this is an example of stories that you will hear throughout my book. You will not just hear tips and tricks and instructions, but you'll hear personal stories that really be like, okay, you can do this and the outcomes can just blow your mind. So like I said, um, this section that I'm going to read to you is from the part about finding places to stay. Now, there's so many different ways to find places to stay, and this story came out of the section where I talk about meeting people at the moment. Just in your daily life, when you're traveling, and you don't know where you're going to stay, you don't have a plan, sometimes it may be last minute, or you're okay with not knowing where you're going to stay, one thing you can do, which is obviously harder with COVID, but you know, in a world where COVID is safer or less prominent or whatever, whenever that is, you can meet hosts at the moment. I like calling it meeting hosts ATM. And I'm going to read this section to you. Here we go. Just as we discussed meeting people who could possibly help you to get to your next destination ATM at the moment, we'll do the same when in search of a place to stay. On some days, you may meet some people that you really connect with during your travels. These folks may offer you a couch to crash on, a bed, or some yard space to pitch a tent. Be open to new experiences. These could lead to new bonds and connections with others. For real, they really do. When talking to people throughout the day, mention that you're traveling and elaborate on how, and maybe why, you're doing it. People are often intrigued and wanting to help. This can provide the perfect opportunity for you to let them know your needs. A safe place to rest or stay. So that was just a small section of explaining what meeting hosts at the moment means. And this is the food for the brain section. And I have little sections throughout the book called food for the brain where I tell personal stories just to give your brain a little snack to munch on (laughs) when you imagine your travels. Here we go. Do you remember when I was talking about meeting people ATM at the moment and getting rides from them? I told a story about a person from a church who took me and my bike to the next destination. This person was on the way to a church camp, picking kids up along the way. On that very same day, I met the person who I now consider my adopted grandpa. The story goes as such. After the person driving the kids and I reached a certain point before the church camp, they dropped me off in a small, cozy town along the coast of California. I knew nothing about the town or area at the time, but I was in what's known as the Emerald Triangle. When I bring up that name now, people often talk about how magical that area is and how much love they have for it. When I got dropped off to an unknown town in a grocery store parking lot, I had no idea where I would be staying for the night and evening was approaching fast. I felt a little bit of panic prickle up inside of me, but decided not to indulge it. It sounds like something from a movie, but my intuition told me that it would be okay if I just walked to the doors of the supermarket. So I did. Before I could even reach the door, I saw some curious characters. I distinctly remember seeing four people. One wearing a suit with crystals attached to it, no lie, who had a live parrot sitting on their shoulder. Another person who was masculine presenting with a strong build and long, dark, flowing curly hair. A third person who was older, with a white beard and a kind smile, and the final person who was a beautiful woman with warm and glowing energy. As I was walking to the store, the one with the curly hair asked me about my bike. It turned out they liked to bike too, and they were really interested in my trip and travels. They then asked me where I was staying for the night, and I expressed my concern about having, seriously, no idea. They immediately offered me a place to stay at their house, as long as I could get my bike up the huge hill that acted as their driveway. They then turned to the older fellow next to them and introduced me to the person known to the town as Brother Tom. After talking to Brother Tom for a few seconds, he also offered me a place to stay. After chatting with both of them, we decided that it would be easier for me to stay with Tom because he lived only about a mile away and there was no hill in front of his house to climb. Thank goddess, I was so tired of hills at that point. (laughs) Before we wrapped up our conversation, 
I wandered into the store, and the woman assured me that these people were good. She had been traveling, too, and met the bunch when she got to town. She had been staying and hanging with this crew for a couple weeks and trusted them. After getting some groceries, I met Brother Tom in the cafeteria section. I then followed him to his house, leading me via bike. Tom had a roommate who agreed that I could stay for the night. They offered me my own room in their house with a mattress and space to bring in my bike. Over the next couple of days, Tom really started to feel like family to me. We went and explored the town together, wood shops, cafes, and the downtown area. We took a trip to see the redwood trees, like the gorgeous giant beasts, and Tom told me about his days at a hitchhiker, giving me some of the tips and tricks that are now included in this book. When we made it to the redwoods, Tom and I rode our bikes together for miles and miles. To my surprise, I struggled a bit to keep up with Tom, who was almost in his 70s. After a day of riding, eating packed salads, and receiving advice on dealing with men, because, I mean, come on, we headed back to the house. When the sun was setting, we pulled over to a beach, and Tom read a passage out of one of his favorite books to me. Although it sounds strange to some, I can honestly tell you that I truly have friends and loved ones out of all ages. Most of us has one thing in common. We want to provide and be careful. Provide care and be cared for. That night, when we got back to the house, Tom finished a story out of the book that he was reading to me and tucked me in as I fell asleep. People, this is no joke. I had such a beautiful time with someone that I had never planned to meet, a situation that started out with fear of the unknown. I ended up staying with Tom for days, and it was emotionally hard to leave. We still keep up with each other and send text messages back and forth every so often. Also email, and we're about to do snail mail letters. This may not happen to you every single time that you are lost and looking for a place to stay, but this is a great example of that travel magic. And then, of course, you can't see this right now because this is a podcast episode, but there is a picture that Brother Tom took of me with this huge flower, like the size of my face, this yellow, gorgeous flower. And then a picture of Brother Tom and his bike smiling, looking at me in front of the redwoods, and he is so cute, and I love him. So that was a story of something gone incredibly right in the meeting, um, in the finding places to stay section of the book, and I want to read one more small section of this part, actually, because I offer a lot of advice in this book, and a lot of it is very unconventional and alternative and um everything has to be taken with a grain of salt and with caution you know we have to be aware of our own privileges and abilities and you know aware of our surroundings because there are dangerous things that can happen so in every part of this book I offer safety tips so these are safety tips for meeting people ATM and staying with them Don't tell anyone your exact travel plans or needs while figuring out if they are the right fit for you. If you change your mind, you don't want them to know exactly where you will be and what you'll be doing. If you have a bad feeling about a situation while planning, don't follow through. If you have a bad feeling while in a situation, leave in the safest way possible. Always let someone know who you are staying with in the exact address. Tell whoever you are staying with that you have shared this information. Alright, so that was something gone incredibly right. And like I said, I still email with Brother Tom. I lost his email and number for a while because I was actually in California where I met him, where he lived. And I went back to that same town and I was searching through my email and my contacts and everything. And I couldn't find him because I wanted to see him so bad because he's so special to me. And then what do you know when I get home? I find his email. I send him an email. It feels just like old times. I told him I was so upset I missed him while he was there. I went into the place where I met him and I went to these other places and I was hoping that maybe magically he would just be there, but he wasn't. So um, hopefully I get to see him again in the future. And if you get this book and you get to see these pictures of him, you can just see the love and kindness in his eyes. And seriously, staying with him was like a movie. It was like a dream. And I've always kind of wanted like grandparents I can be close with, which I don't have. And he really was like that role and just all these other special roles to me like the advice giver the wisdom holder the seer like all of these things that I just have been craving he was that and he's amazing and I love his company and I am so glad I have him in my life and that was a situation that could have gone really wrong getting dropped off in the in in this town I'd never been to at a grocery store market and not knowing where I was gonna go that night Um, but it went incredibly right. So yeah, 
And I was going to read How to Find Work, but you know what? I don't want to add on, end on a bad story, so we're going to read a story that went incredibly wrong. Recording session was interrupted. So now we're going to make up a song. And we're going to remix the Joel song to talk about my travel guide that's coming out. And we didn't practice it at all, so this is all on the spot. Okay, you ready? I forgot to play the cajon. I'll do one trick. This story is very short, so I'll elaborate it a little on it a little bit more after I'm done reading it. So, this is the food for the brain section in finding places like how to find work. And actually, this goes right behind the other section I'm going to read. Oh well. This is in the section on how to find work. And in this section, as I'll read to you next, I talk about wolfing, which is um, staying on an organic farm, doing work. 
And for doing so many hours of work, usually you do 20 to 25 hours of work per week, you get a place to stay, and you are supposed to get food. So, here is the situation that went incredibly wrong. All right. Well, this went okay before this. This is part of the same section. The story that comes incredibly wrong will come after this, but I'm going to read this whole food for the brain section. Thus far in my traveling career, I've wolfed a handful of times. Each place that I've stayed at has been extremely different. The first time that I experienced wolfing was on a small goat farm in Virginia right before I started my bike tour. Some of my duties include feeding the animals, cleaning stalls, painting the barn, and cleaning out the water tubs. Because I live vegan, I decided that I wouldn't milk the goats, collect eggs, make soap that had stolen goat milk in it, or anything else that didn't align with my values and still doesn't. This was an important conversation for us to have before I stepped foot onto the farm. And I did write this in the section, and I want to note this now. I would not wolf on a farm that uses and exploits animals. Um, when I did, I was just younger, and I didn't have as strong as beliefs and I didn't know as much as I know now. Um, so it was a good experience at the time. That's why I don't mind sharing it. But just to know, I would not wolf on a farm like that now. The owners of the farm were great, although they were very different. We enjoyed our time together and really brought some new energies into each other's lives. During my stay at the farm, the owner's brother passed away. She had to go to New York to take care of things, leaving me and her partner at the farm. Her partner worked on a military base and was gone most of the day. I quickly learned how to do all of the tasks that needed to be completed. Soon, I was running the farm. The one thing that I valued the most was spending time with the other animals. Goats, chickens, ducks, dogs, cats, pigs, and a llama, all of which lived on the farm. There was one person who captured, and captured my heart more than anyone, Bertie the Pig. And Birdie the Pig is actually the first pig that I really got to hang out with. And there is a picture of her and I in, like, a little mud puddle in the book. And I really love that picture. Um, while I was there, they actually took a picture of us with a rainbow behind us. And like I said, I would never work on a farm again that exploits animals. But at the time, I, you know, I was different and I just wanted to be close to them. And I really felt like spending time with a pig helped my advocacy because I was like, yeah, I know someone. I know Birdie and I love her and all of these things. All right, so now we get into a wolfing situation gone very sour. <laughs> Not all wolfing experiences have ha such happy endings, though. During the summer of 2017, I wolfed on a farm in Los Angeles. When I talked to the owner, she assured me that I would be a great fit for the farm. Looking at the profile pictures and information, I agreed with her. Soon after arriving at the farm, I realized that it was lacking some important elements, such as funds and organization. The absence of solid direction and clarity from the owner complicated the process of making any real progress on the, farm, on the tasks. We would all finish one job that we had spent hours on, and I need to add, this was in LA in the summer. We would have like a 10-hour workday, and we would be doing tasks like rolling hay bales up a hill or something like that that was extremely laborious. And she would come through and tell us to completely change it or undo it. Although she had seemingly good intentions, working on that farm really tried my patience. She also lacked the sufficient funds to feed everyone at the time. So we would buy food and then give her our receipts to get paid back sometime in the future. Which sometimes never happened. A lot of the time it never happened. So that was another bad thing about working there. We would do all these hours and then not get what we were told we would get in exchange for it. Here's where it gets really bad. At one point, a few of us got sent out into the desert of Palmdale. We were staying in an abandoned house that had no electricity, security measures, no water, no cooling system. Let me explain this a little bit more because I don't go in full detail on the book, but this house, like I said, in the desert of Palmdale in California, this house like didn't have some windows, didn't have some doors, and it was really clear that people had been using that house to do drugs in. And she owned this house, like the farm owner did. And she was going to redo it and like kind of make it this retreat for women. So we were both about to go, we were supposed to go fix it up, which is like not really part of wolfing, but that's what she wanted us to do. And me and the other wolfers at the time didn't have a lot of money. So we were kind of, we felt really stuck doing what she wanted us to do. So just imagine this, this house no, like, 
yeah, no cooling, no water, the temperature's over 100 degrees, no windows in some parts, no doors on some parts, and there's clearly people's clothes and, like, needles and all this stuff in there. At one point, oh wait, I said that. <laughs> Um, it was hot and brutal. Temperatures would easily pass 100 degrees and we would all be fighting not to overheat. The house didn't feel secure and we were cleaning it out before I stayed. We found lots of needles and other items that were being used for drugs. It wasn't an ideal situation. My expectations of what would happen on the farm and in the desert were not met. There was a lot of drama, crying, confusion, and arguing at the farm. And this wasn't between us wolfers, us workers. This was between us and the farm owner. On the flip side, I met the most amazing group of humans there who happened to be wolfing at the same time as me. We were quite a diverse group, and we quickly and solidly bonded. Through all the challenges that I experienced on that farm, meeting them was the hardest. Which, it truly was the hardest, like, meeting all those people that I had met, but... <laughs> Working out in the desert um, was quite terrifying. And the thing was is that when we were working on this farm, first I got sent out with a group of people that I was used to, that I had been on the farm in L.A. with, and we all knew, like, this is not a good place, but we were all kind of broke at the time, and everyone was kind of sticking it out until they could find something else to move on to, right? So people got so sick of this place of, like, the person who ran it was just kind of being manic, which is fine, but manic in the way where, like I said, we'd do all these things and then she'd tell us to undo it and she'd be crying and she'd be screaming and I would be crying because I'm sensitive and then other wolfers would be arguing with her and she did some things that were unethical and how she treated animals and, and I was vegan and my friend was vegan and another person there was vegan. Like we all really cared about animals and we're like, this is not right. And then we felt like we needed to stay to take care of the animals because she was doing such a bad, horrible job. Oh, and then animal control was con call called and all of this. It was just a big old drama fest. So anyways, those people that knew what was going on that I had bonded with eventually left before I did because they had found other things. And then um, there were four French guys who I had met on the farm briefly, but they all came out to the house in Palmdale with me where we were supposed to take care of these dogs that we had out there, um, that she wanted to live there so that they'd have more room. Long story. But anyway, I really loved these French guys. They were really cool. They were awesome to hang out with. They were fun. They were respectful. But only one of them really spoke English. Um, and so... You know, it's hard sometimes with that language barrier to feel totally comfortable with people or totally connected or feel like you're in their group. And they did the best job that they could trying to include me. But just living in this awful situation, like having to walk down the road somewhere just to see if they'd give us water. Um, we didn't have a vehicle at the time. Having to sit in like over 100 degree heat with like all these dogs running around trying to keep them alive because they're so hot, having to find water for them. All of these things was just really stressful. So it was hard not to be around people that I already really knew and trusted. You know what I mean? So that was a really bad situation. And I ended up getting picked up by a friend of a friend, my friend Patrick now, who I had never met before. And he took me to Las Vegas and I was there for a while. Um, but that was a really bad and scary situation <sighs> especially just being the only female out there at night where people had obviously been using that property for drugs and other things and just being in my tent with no locks on the doors and no doors in some parts of the house it was it was very scary bad situation um all right so like i said this food for the brain that i just read to you which is a which is a story gone incredibly wrong is in the story or in the part of the book where I talk about how to find work. So the last section that I'm going to read for you is right now, page 132, um, how to find work. So let's get into this. This is all about how to find work and jobs to make money or places to stay through that work. Bilbo. Sorry, Bilbo's our rabbit. He's eating the carpet <laughs> while on the road. Simmer down, folks, because this is an important section. People often approach me feeling lost when it comes to finding work on the road. The more you network, the easier it is. I repeat, 
The more you network, the easier it is. On my first trip across the USA, I was constantly working. I had started that trip with a few hundred dollars and used the money that I did have to repair my bike. So every time that I needed food, I found work. Every time that I needed extra cash to buy a bus ticket, I found work. Because I was working so much, I was networking and making connections left and right. On some occasions, I would walk into a restaurant asking to work for a meal and walk out with various odd jobs, a place to stay, and a steady supply of food. While I completed these tasks, I got to spend time with new people, explore new places, and walk away with cash in my pocket. So, you may say, how can I find work in the first place? Finding work while traveling is not as complicated as you may think. Many factors and privileges can play into this experience as well, so keep that in mind. Where should you be looking for work? Look everywhere, up, down, and all around. Some examples of places to ask are small local businesses, restaurants, hotels, hostels, cafes, and any other shops or stores that you see in town. If you know of a local farmer who doesn't actively exploit animals, they only work with vegetables and other plants, that may be a good place to check as well. What do I say? When you find a place you'd like to ask for work, it's pretty simple. Walk in and ask for what you need. Use the same model that we did in Chapter 6, but tailor the introduction to meet your current work needs. After you do it a couple of times, it may start to feel, you may start to feel more ease and confidence in your own ability to ask for what you need. Alright, so with that little introduction, I have a food for the brain, and then I have some ways to find work while you're on the road, and, um, should I read this food for the brain? Let me, I'll, I'll do it, just so you can get a good idea of what I'm talking about in this section. All right. On my bike tour across the USA, I found myself in a little town searching for work so that I could leave that same town. This is the place where I walked into a restaurant looking for food and walked out with a job and place to stay. Before I hit the jackpot, I was wandering around downtown wanting to make some cash. I saw a small local business that sold furniture. When I walked in, the person behind the counter was the owner. After introducing myself and stating my needs, they immediately put me to work vacuuming the floor. When I was done with that task, I picked up some rags and spray and began to wipe everything down. After about an hour and a half, the job was done. I left a spotless store with cash in my hand. On my bike touring trip, I had an easier time finding work because of all of the networking I did the year before and all the connections that I kept up with. During the bike tour, I ended up alone, cold, frustrated, and crying standing in someone's driveway. I didn't know it was a driveway until they tried to pull in, which required me to move my tired and crying body out of the way. To make a long story short, this couple took me in, treated me like their own child, and endlessly showed me care and affection. I ended up working for them on their catering company crew, learning a new skill, and attending a couple of events. A couple years later, when I was back in California, they already had a job lined up for me. I spent, a couple, I spent four days with them, working hard, and came out with $400. That, to me, is incredibly useful when traveling. If I hadn't been searching for work or networking so much on my first trip, I would have had to spend more time searching for work on that specific trip. All right, here's something you can do while trying to find work. Consider wolfing. No, I don't mean barking like a dog. WWOOF, Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms, USA, is an online space where you can connect with organic farms and you can do this all across the USA, you can also do this in other countries, and work for them. While wolfing, you usually work at least five days, around four to five hours a day, in exchange for food and a place to stay. To use wolf, you have to be 18 years or older and pay a yearly membership that costs you $40 in the USA. To learn about wolf opportunities in other countries, you'll have to visit the country-specific site. You're also provided with a wide variety of options on your stay length. You can choose anywhere from one day, multiple weeks, months, or long term. On the wolf website, they call themselves an educational and cultural experience pro or cultural exchange program. I found this to be true. Every time that I've wolfed, no matter what kind of taste the experience left in my mouth, I've learned something. While wolfing, you're likely to meet other travelers and folks from other countries. And then in this section, I walk you exactly through how to find the wolf website and sign up to be a wolfer, set up your profile, all of those tedious things. 
Um, and then let me keep reading from this section. Once you've landed a farming gig, all you have to do is show up. Each farm is different, so when you're talking to the owners, make sure you ask detailed questions and gather all the information that you're looking for. They may think that you're a good fit for the farm, but the farm may not be a good fit for you as you heard of my other story. Ask, ask, ask. Leave no stone unturned. Hot tip. Instead of officially wolfing, why not try to connect with the vegan animal sanctuary? They provide refuge and forever homes for neglected, abused, unwanted, exploited, and sick non-human animals. Often these individuals come from or escape the deathly clutches of animal agriculture. Please be mindful, though, that not every animal sanctuary is open to visitors or work exchangers. Some sanctuary founders and animal caregivers are overworked and stretched thin. Sometimes having outsiders or inexperienced volunteers can create extra work. With that said, other sanctuaries have specific programs set up for work exchangers or internships and, I, and love to have new helpers and volunteers. While working at a sanctuary, you can expect to work with all types of amazing people such as ducks, ch cows, chickens, roosters, turkeys, horses, pigs, goats, sheep, llamas, alpacas, rab rabbits, geese, fish, and more. I said rabbits. Rabbits. Your duties may include helping with feeding shifts, scooping poop, fun fun, managing pastures, and administering medication, medication, and giving an abundance of appreciated belly rubs and cow kisses. You can find a list of sanctuaries across the USA in the resources below. It never hurts to reach out to ones that you're interested in and ask them if they do work exchanges. I will also list some of my favorite vegan sanctuaries that aren't open for work exchanges but love giving tours and having volunteers at the end of the book. Spending time with farmed animals in a loving, safe, and supportive environment is such a special experiences. experience. With the right setting, their personalities and quirks are easily able to shine through. Have you ever spent your afternoon lounging with cows or giving a demanding pig an hour-long belly rub? If not, you are missing out. If you're able to, consider donating to, a to any sanctuary that you tour. Even the smallest chunk of change goes a long way in a sanctuary. If you aren't able to connect with any vegan sanctuaries in person, connect with them online and step into a whole new world of compassion, love, acceptance, joy, and care. Follow sanctuaries on social media and share. This is a simple, free, and effective form of activism. And so... As you saw, I gave you one way right there um, how to find work when you're on the road, and that is using wolfing. Now, there are so many ways to find work while you're on the road, and in the book, I give you a lot of them. And if I read that whole entire section on here, it would honestly take a really long time because there are many different ways to find work. So I'm just going to list some of the other ways that I wrote about in the book. Um, for finding work while you are on the road because there's a lot of different ways, like I said. 132. All right. Here are some other things that you can do while you're on the road to find work. You can use WorkAway, um, which is like an official thing <laughs> that's like wolfing that is all set up online. So basically it's like wolfing except you can do more jobs. You might teach kids, you might nanny, you might build a house. There's so many different things. So work away, like I said, is like wolfing except it's just a little less strict. And yeah, the rest of it is a surprise. So thank you so much for listening to this podcast episode. I hope you got a good little feel of what the book is like. Obviously, there's so much more information in it, other surprises, pictures, stories, all of that good stuff. So under this podcast description, I will link to the GoFundMe if you'd like to help donate to get this book printed or the GoFundMe is the best place to read about this book. So go to that link just to see the description, learn a little bit more about the book, share it with friends. And if you go to unrulytravel.com, uh, there should be a pop-up for my newsletter. So enter your email in there, enter your name, sign up for my newsletter, and I will let you know when the book is out. I'm also thinking about doing a pre-order little thing, so I will let you know soon if that is an option. Again, thank you so much to everyone for supporting me, for listening, and please uh, give this podcast a rating on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to it. It's a free way that you can really help me out. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great day.
make the world a better place by leaving things better than I found it. You know, whether it be people or the planet or, you know, all kinds of things. Isn't there a quote that says, feel fear and do it anyways? Yeah. 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 So I think for us in significance, we have to do it ourselves. A lot of people are doing things in their life that they're not completely happy with, mm -hmm. and they're doing it just because, you know, it's a norm and they feel like they feel pressured by society. Definitely. Or they're just, you know, stuck in this rut. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ruts can be comfortable for people. And they can be very comfortable. Comfort is not how you, how you grow as a person. <laughs>